Hi, today we're going to talk about security in IoT. Um, this is a very, very important field. Um, if you ignore this, you will cause a lot of problems for your clients and you will have a lot of problems selling other products. So this is really, really important. So you, you need to understand the security issues. <coughs> So we will talk why about why security is important in IoT. Security is important in general, but when it comes to hardware and things that control hardware, it's pre it's precisely um, no, it's particularly um, very very dangerous. We will talk how to secure a device, how to secure a network, and how to manage updates to software. So why is IoT security important? Um, in IoT, one of the words words is things. So if security issues would affect software up to now, you now have things that rely on software and that interact with the environment. So security issues migrate from the cyber world to the real world through Internet of Things. Internet of Things is everywhere. Like As I said, every field will use software and connection to the network. So a security breach in one of the components is a, is a security breach in the real world. Here are some security examples. So as I said, up to now it was a cyber problem, only software. But if you use Apple HomeKit, um, your door locks, your car lock is controlled by the internet, by something, something that is connected to the internet an attacker will simply unlock your door house. Your yeah. House appliances are connected to the internet. They burn their physical devices. Somebody can make your printer burn, your microwave oven burn, your fridge burn. If they change the software and control it in a different way, something might, uh, might actually blow up. Um, then again, if you have a fridge, you might be surprised that it's actually mining bitcoins or it's crashing servers all over the world and you just have the impression that the fridge is cooling your food. But in fact, it's compromised and its software is doing something totally different. And don't get me wrong, there's no way that you can find out. Unless you're an IT specialist and you can watch your internet traffic, you have no idea what your fridge does when it's alone at home. Uh, medical devices, imagine hacking pacemakers. Somebody might die because the hacking of a medical device. And you have medical devices which are controlled over wireless. So somebody on the street can have a problem. Public utilities, you can shut down the power grid, the water supply. This is really, really dangerous. Like connecting these devices to the internet is a bad idea in general. But then again, you cannot go against the trend. So if you connect them, Keep in mind that security is particularly important when it comes to things. The rule of thumb or the law of security is you always want security by design, not by obscurity. 90% of the security today is done by obscurity, meaning it, there's a company that has a closed box and that, that does security. They think that, okay, if no one knows how this box is made, then no one can break it. So it's secure. And that's true, if you don't know how it's made, it's more difficult to break it, but somebody will. And if they break one, they break all of them. And moreover, because somebody broke it, it's particularly difficult for companies that do security to protect it, because the only ones that know how it's made is the attacker and its producer. So if the producer is not able to secure it, and he wasn't in the first place, nobody can help you. When it's security by design, usually it's an open product. Like the security thing is not that no one knows how it's, done, how it's done, everybody knows. But it's theoretically proven or mathematically proven that it's secure. So they use some means to secure it which are open and the security comes from some mathematical process usually. Is, it, is this clear? If somebody compromises this thing, it's easy to fix because not only the provider can do it, but anyone, anybody in the world can do it. Examples are SSL. SSL was broken several times. The community fixed it immediately. So as soon as a vulnerability showed up, they knew how to fix it. 
for a black box, this is, this is difficult. So always keep in mind security by design, not by obscurity. And th this is the way to go. Companies start to migrate towards this. So how do we secure a device? Um, we are talking about local security, so what happens on the device, network security, software that runs on the device, and also about the hardware that runs on the device. So local security. This, this is really simple. First of all, change the default password. Like for the Raspberry Pi, if you have a device with a Raspberry Pi and take the image of the Raspberry Pi, it's Pi and Raspberry. If you don't change this, anybody can break into it. For the Beaglebone, it's Debian and Temp PWD. I can show you several devices that are commercially uh, sold which never cared to change this data. If you buy a router, a wireless router, how is your password? By default, it's the same. Like you just go online, type the name of the router, default password, and you find it. You will be surprised how many people will not change that. It's really stupid. The example is MiraiNet. MiraiNet was a network of bots, basically devices all over the world, that was doing denial of service attacks. Meaning, they were spamming servers in order to keep them out of the network. They broke into the devices using the default credentials for devices. They had a huge database for default credentials for routers, and it was seriously an easy task to break them. Because these routers used <laughs> default password. So this is really, really bad practice. Change it. When you ship a device, if you buy a more expensive router, you will see inside the box a sticker with the username and the password, which is unique for every unit that you buy. So when we, you buy a more expensive router, that router will have a default unique password, which is not able, which is not breakable, because it's only you that, you, that have, has the sticker. Is this clear? So be careful about default passwords. Secondly, never make a default password based on something on the device, by the MAC address or something else. Like, really, when you deploy a device, find a way to put a random password, and that's a random password. Another thing is, um, you need to be careful about the random generator. When you want to generate random things, be sure that that thing really generates a random number. Um, the good example is ATMs, like the, the devices where you get out money. Those ATMs need to generate a random string. Most of them generate a random string based on the time, and that's really bad, or based on a cable that is left in the air. There's a really interesting paper on how to break these ATMs, either by rebooting them forcibly, like you give them an electroshock, it reboots, and then you can find out pretty closely the random number. Either you know where that cable in the air is, and just put zero into it, like connect it to the ground. So be very, very careful with the random number. Secondly, disable all unused services. Like if you buy a Raspberry Pi and take its normal image, it's full of services for development. Production devices, they don't need SSH. Like SSH is not something that you want on the device. Usually they have no user interface. Disable it, meaning delete the damn files. Secondly, disable the default login. If you buy a Raspberry Pi, it boots up with a graphic interface, never asks you for a password. Disable that. Another service is Avahi. Avahi is a discovery service that we have used to discover the Raspberry Pi. Once it goes into production, if you don't need it, and usually you don't for a gadget, just turn it off. An attacker doesn't need to know what is the IP of your Raspberry Pi. Samba, or SMB, is file sharing, and this is one a cry. This network protocol is for sharing files. It's open on devices. Shut it down after, when you, when you go into production, shut it down. WannaCry broke into computers that were using SMB version 1, built in the 90s or earlier. Industrial robots with Windows XP, they did not need this. 
So just turn it off. WannaCry was dangerous because they were exploiting something that was done 35 or 40 years ago. But it was active. So just shut down every service that you don't need. Simply, before going to into production, check the ports that are open. And see for every one of them if you really need it. So this is really important. Secondly, disable administration over the air. So if the device needs to be administered, don't leave it over the air. If you have a wireless router, simply connect your computer over a cable. This, it has a checkbox. Disable it. If you allow administration over the air, somebody that breaks into your network from the street, and that's not that difficult, will be able to administer the device. But if you disable this over the air, it doesn't matter if it breaks into the network, the device will not accept administrative commands from the air. So use it over the cable. With the cable, it's difficult. It, it needs physical access. Is this clear? So th this is common sense, but you need to understand to do it. Like when you, when you go into production, just make a checklist out of these. And before shipping an image, just check the boxes. If you have any questions. Network security. Like Network security is really important. And it's not breaking in into the device. It means how do you communicate over the network. And it doesn't matter if it's the local network or the internet. It still should be secure. Local network, you would say, ah, it's only the local network. If it's not on cable, somebody might sniff packets. And with uh, an enough amount of time, he might be able to actually get your communication. So be careful. If you're sending over the air, it doesn't matter if it's a local network, think of it as a public network. First rule, avoid self-written protocols. If you need to communicate with some device, do not write your own protocol. Why not? Because you're the only one using it. You are doing security by obscurity. People will not know how your protocol is, but it's breakable. It's easily breakable. No one except you is testing this. So there's not a huge amount of users that will actually test the protocol. Is it theoretically secure? Did you actually mathematically prove it? No. Firewalls might actually stop your protocol. So if a firewall is smart enough, it will simply cut your protocol out. So avoid using that. Use protocols which are known for this and use them in a secure way. So if you do HTTP, use HTTPS. Why? HTTPS does two things. The most easy one is it encrypts traffic. So your traffic flows through the internet, but it's encrypted. Secondly, super important, it authenticates the server. So before sending one bit of data, it will ask the server to authenticate itself with, certifi with the certificate. So you can be sure that some, that server is the one that you need. Otherwise, if somebody breaks a DNS, they can fake a server super easy. So use HTTPS. MQTT. Use it over SSL. SSL will ask the MQTT server to provide a certificate before it communicates with you. So you can be sure that you are actually communicating with the server that you want and not a fake one. Secondly, again, it encrypts traffic. XMPP, if you need a more complicated protocol, do not use a TCP socket, use XMPP. XMPP will exchange messages between devices in a secure way. Why? It authenticates the server. It authenticates the device to the server. And if it needs to send data to a device that is not connected to the same server, it will authenticate the other server before actually sending the data. In contrast with a lot of other protocols like internet relay chat or even email. Email is sending messages from server to server, but usually without authenticating the server. XMPP makes sure that if it contacts another server, it's actually the server that he wants to contact and not a fake one. 
when it comes to devices, if you, co if you connect it to the internet, use a computer, not a microcontroller. Usually a microcontroller, without any special chip, will not be able to implement any of these. So be very, very careful when you use this. Use a computer like the Raspberry Pi to get out to the internet and use some other way of communication for small microcontrollers. Read before implementing. It takes you a day, a week. Before delivering a product, read some security things. See what others do. Get some best practices. Because your problems, for sure, are the problems of others as well. So read. Is this clear? And any questions? Um, try to understand the security issue. Not, not just read, okay, you need to do this. Don't do it mechanically. Try to understand, okay, why is this a security issue and how does it affect me? Make some scenarios. Like, I if you have a device, make some scenarios. Okay, this is an attack. How can it affect my device? And what's the damage that it can do? From the hardware point of view, like, use the right hardware for the right job. Look at this stack and use it accordingly. Meaning, if you have a sensor, don't jump with it to the cloud. Connect it to some local processing that is more capable of connecting to the cloud and actually doing this in a secure way. If you have a sensor, I will bet with you that this one is not secure. It can do some security to some extent, but yeah. So observe the stack and use it accordingly. Now, if you remember the difference between microcontrollers and computers, microcontrollers are simple systems. Two kilobytes of RAM would be something normal for a microcontroller. A key, an RSA key, is two kilobytes. So there's no way that this thing can actually do something secure. Secondly, if you write your own software, most of, in most of the cases, you won't be able to actually make it secure. So if you really need to communicate over a network with the microcontroller, try to use some real-time OS. And you can find Riot OS, Contiki, FreeRTOS, something. That is, that is a mi mini operating system, but that has some basic knowledge about security. And if you really need to connect it over a network, connect it to a local network, if possible, over a cable. Is it clear? Moreover, uh, the IP stack was never made for devices like f of this size. So use a connection method that maybe does not include IP, a simpler stack, but a, a stack that was designed with security in mind, like LoRa or some different protocol. For full computers, like, like the Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone, that, there's no problem, because you can connect them to the local network, to the internet, they have a large memory and they run some OS. As long as this Linux OS is up to date, no problem here. Like, it's like a normal computer. So right tool for the right job. For the software, this is something that you need to understand very, very well. First of all, use only supported software. So if you buy some device, and you choose a device for some project, make sure that the software is supported and its producers keep it up to date. For several devices, like the BeagleBone, you have several software images, all of them probably Linux. Some of them are maintained, some are not. If the software is two years, is done, if the image was built two years ago, that's an issue. In two years, there's thousands of security bugs that you can find, and if the image was not updated in two years, that image is full of bugs. You will say, okay, I will, I will update it. It's difficult to do this because some problems are in the drivers. And you won't be able to handle those. So if you encounter devices like the chip, it's $5, or like the banana pie, super hardware, better than the Raspberry Pi, the software is really bad. Like it's a software that's two or three years uh, old. They don't keep it up to date. They don't have the power to do this. 
even if the hardware is nice, if the software is really crappy, security-wise, I would never recommend it. If you sell it to a client, think twice, because he might sue you afterwards. Your client will never understand this, but he understands when his pockets are going down. Other devices that are pretty well maintained, it's the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino Yoon, BeagleBone, Arduino Tian, Yudu is well maintained. So choose a device where the software is really well maintained. Um, upstream changes. If you do some changes to the software, mostly to the kernel, if it's Linux, try to push them upstream, like with the good practice of open source. Just let me give you an example. There's a there's a device from a big company. They made around 10,000 modifications to the Linux kernel to make the device run. 10,000. None of them was pushed upstream. Upstream means I'm pushing back the modification, so it's in the public kernel. Everybody can use it, and the default kernel will actually have these modifications. Well, here's the problem. That was one kernel version. When they need to update the kernel, meaning take a new kernel because it's better, it has security fixes, they need to backport these 10,000 modifications because they're not in the kernel. And this is difficult because the kernel API changes. So what they did, they actually used the old kernel version continuously, which is full of bugs and has security issues, but there was no way for them to backport 10,000 modifications. They were kicked out of the market. So whenever you make a change, try to push it upstream so that the developers of the software will have it in the software and they will do the work for you. Otherwise, you will have to backport the changes again. Use open libraries. This is important. And this comes with security by design, not obscurity. If you have an open source library, it's maintained. There's a huge um, pool of users and contributors that will make changes and security updates. If it's some library that's not open source, it's a company that provides it, you rely on the company to make updates. And they won't, because they don't care. They say, okay, it's working, no problem. And this is something that they did in the industry. So in the industry, if something was working, they would leave it like that. Like Windows XP is in a lot of industrial robots. But that was fine as long as the robot was not connected to any network or to a public network, that was fine. But the second you connect that to a network, it becomes a huge liability. Wanna cry? actually exploited this. Factories were closed because WannaCry was attacking Windows XP systems. It was so bad that Microsoft made updates for Windows XP. So understand this. If it's a closed thing, the industry says it's working. They will never update it. So use open libraries. Open libraries are always updated. Because somebody will use it, somebody will make a new device, and that guy will understand, whoa, I have a problem. He will make the change and push it upstream. The second question that you need to, answer, to ask is, okay, it's open source. Do I really want to use this library? Look at its repository. If it's open source, usually it's GitHub. On GitHub, if you see zero stars or zero followers, and the last change is two years ago or three years ago, this is not maintained. So really ask your question, do I really want to use this? One, does it have security issues? Probably yes. If something doesn't work, will somebody make a change? Probably no. It's up to you. So really, really careful. Is it compatible with new things? Probably no. This is what you want to use. Something that has thousands of followers, um, a lot of stars, and it's updated on a, not daily, but at least monthly basis, usually weekly basis. So this is something that you want to use. And definitely, if it says deprecated, <laughs> that's a no-go. So think twice. 
Another big question when it comes to security is how do I update the device? Because like if it's a microcontroller and it's not connected to the network, so for instance, it's um, I don't know, heater in your in your house or air conditioning system. Once you write the software, it will work. It's not connected to the internet, it doesn't need new features. But if it's connected to the internet, you need to make security patches because you will have security issues. You need to update the software because you will want to offer new features on the device. So how do you do this? If you just write an image and you're not prepared for this, like you will have 100,000 customers. How do you deploy a new image to them? Do you sell them a new SD card? That's a, that's a good point, but he needs to pay. Do you make it over the air? If yes, how do you do it? And not only how do you do it, how do you do it in such a way that you don't brick the device? If your update fails, what happens? Because if your update fails, the device will not be able to update itself. And going to 10 or 100,000 customers to reboot the device and put a new SD card won't work. So there's two things that you need to keep in mind when you update the software. One is the operating system. The second one is the application. For the operating system, you need usually a dual partition. Meaning the operating system will make, if you have an operating system that is 100 megabytes, you will have a disk with 200 megabytes. The first 100 is a partition with the operating system. When it updates, it will write a new system on the other 100 megabytes. When the update is ready, the system reboots and boots into the second partition. If something goes wrong, the system will reboot, go to the first partition, you will have a running system, and it will report to you in the cloud that, hey, your update is, is, has a problem. But the user will not have a big downtime. So the user will not actually notice this, and you will be able to fix it. Imagine if you make an update without this feature, you brick the device. Chromebooks do this. When it comes to your applications, you need the same thing. You need to be able to update an application, and if it doesn't work, you need to roll it back with all its data. So if you need to migrate data to the new version, when you roll it back, it needs to be the same. And this you can do in two ways. In an open source way, with Snap, made by Ubuntu, which has a store, and you can use their store or white label it, but being open source, you can write your own store for this. So you can either use the Ubuntu service, but if you don't want to, you can write your store. It's completely specified how, and you will always use your own cloud store for your clients. The second one is the Google store. They do Android things. They will handle updates for you in the same way they do it with the mobile devices. But then again, you are closed to Google. As far as I know, there's no way to build your own app store here. Well, it's still in preview, in beta preview. It's something to keep in mind. But if you're connected to Google, if they do something that you don't like, and you already have 100,000, 200,000 devices sold, you will have an issue. So you need to really read the terms of agreement. Google Store, though, is able to update your operating system in a secure way. Snap is not. So you need to find another way to update the operating system, meaning it knows how to update the kernel, but not the whole partition. And it's not out of the box if it boots in a wrong way. So it's still your business to do this. So it's either Snapcraft, either Android things. There's others as well, but these ones work pretty well. Snap is still in development and still um, unstable or testing on some platforms, but you can choose Ubuntu, Ubuntu Core and it works. So keep in mind that you will need to update devices. And from the first day that you start a product, think of this and put it in your um, expenses for the product. Is this clear? You, you need security updates, you need new features. This is really important. The second question is, how do you verify that the software that you update is really the software that you want? And there's no, not, there's no person in the middle that will change your software, or there's no other entity that was, is pushing an update to your device. 
And usually this is done by digital keys in software. Digital keys or digital signatures that are verified at install time, and Snap and Android things do this, also, usually, it's, it's a good idea to secure boot, meaning to verify with the, with the hardware that the software is actually authentic. Like, digital signature are, signatures are fine as long as the operating system is not tempered. Like, the operating system can verify digital signatures in a secure way as long as it's not modified. But who can verify the, the software, the operating system? And this is where you usually need hardware. So you will sign, digitally sign your operating system, and there is a piece of hardware that will not boot the operating system if the digital signature is wrong. Is this clear? Some devices know how to do this, some don't, like the Raspberry Pi. But there is a separate device that you can put on the Raspberry Pi, which stores keys and authenticates the hardware. Once this device is placed over here, and you put it in production mode, meaning you need to attach another hardware piece to this piece, it will burn the Raspberry Pi's fingerprint into this device. This device will not work on another Raspberry Pi. So once you sell this, this device will be the only one that will be able to decrypt the software that you, that you send, and authenticate the software that you send. If the user changes the Pi, or some attacker goes to a factory and changes the Pi, this device will refuse to verify anything. So an attacker will not be able to change this one. And this, this is not at home, but in a factory, you can have a malicious employee who can change, especially because this is cheap, who can change the main board of a robot and compromise it in a way that the software is OK, but the hardware will not listen to the software. Is this clear? So usually when you do something for the industry, think of trusted software and not only digitally signing, which is valid for home devices, like Android does this, and iOS does this, but also secure boot it. Like be sure that the operating system that it starts is really authentic, and somebody did not tamper with the hardware. Is this clear? A device like this costs like $29. And you can buy it in an industry scale for much, for much less. But is this thing clear? Such devices have a trusted store, meaning they have some security keys, some signing keys, which cannot be extracted by any method. Like not even taking the device and destroying it will help. So once the key is written, electronically it's impossible to recover it. Is it clear? Most probably, when you try to hard, hard recover the key, it damages the key. Besides that, it has some APIs for encrypting, securing, verifying that the hardware is authentic, and so on and so forth. This is important. Some devices, you mo mostly the ones for the industry, have this chip embedded into it. New CPUs, even ARM CPUs, have this embedded into, it, into them. To sum up, always think as security by design, not by obscurity. Uh, think of local things that you can do, like closing services. Think of how you communicate with the network. Be sure to be secure. Think several times how do you update your device, and how do you update it on a big, big scale. And think that security is really important. Because somebody will breach your device. The thing is, how do you control the damage and how do you fix it fast? Companies that will do this will grow and will be the leaders. Companies that ignore this won't stand the chance. If you have any questions,